This is one of our spirit schools, ministered by Gustave Leroux. Please enjoy it. Know that it will take you deeper, higher, and wider into Yahweh. Please subscribe and have a great day. Father, we just want to come to your throne right now in the name of Yeshua. And I know that there's, there's so much you're doing in the hearts of the Ecclesia right now. I mean, I, I, in my heart, I'm so excited. In my heart, I'm so full of joy and full of happiness, full of everything that you've placed there in the last couple of days, Father God, in the last couple of weeks. Really, in the last year, you have placed so much in me that I can feel the, the weightiness of your presence in everything I do, that I can literally not... Con Continue in something knowing that it is not fully you. It's like you come in and you want to want to align me constantly. So I'm excited, Father. I'm excited when I look at the lives of those that I love and care for, those uh, that I speak into, even those who speak into me, into my life, how they have changed over the last couple of months because of what you're really doing in the ecclesia right now, Father. There's, a, there's an explosion of love. There's an explosion of your fullness, of holiness, of purity that is coming to the body of Christ, it's coming to the ecclesia that is incredible. Father, you are raising a standard that is above all standards. You are placing a responsibility on your body that has never been there. We, we are beginning to realize that we are to govern creation and what it takes to be governing creation from out of your DNA, from out of who you are, from living, moving, having our being in you and bringing that fullness into creation, bringing who you are into where we are, are right now. Lord, it's incredible and we're excited about it. So right now, Father, I ask that, that tonight you would, you would open up the gateways and the doorways of, of everything that you want to place onto the frame of your sons and daughters, Lord. We're beginning to understand that there's a framework that Yahweh is building uh, for the body of Christ. So what He's about to pour into us, what He's about to lay on us, we can handle, we can run with. And Father, as we operate from out of your four faces, as we operate from out of the yard, hey, vav, hey, we begin to understand the power, the glory, the fullness, the fire that we get from you, that we can use in the earth to align creation and to bring your people to full fruition of who we are as sons and daughters. Father, it's an exciting time. And I ask, Father, you open up our eyes and as spirit beings, let's in, expand into all of who you are, Yahweh. Let's in that same breath come into the atmosphere and expand oh, our spirit man over the, the earth in his full capacity. Let's begin to expand who we are, full of your presence, full of your glory, into all of creation so the alignment can be done. Father, we've waited 2,000 years, but we have been waiting for you and you've been waiting for us. Now we begin to understand that it's our responsibility as sons and daughters to answer the call of creation and to bring alignment to bring restoration to all things. Father, we're excited. We love you. We praise you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, so I don't know exactly where to start. I mean, when I think about it, I was probably, I was born into a church, right? Uh, I say I was born into a church, but from, from the time that I can remember, my mother was a social worker, <laughs> which is kind of depressing because she was, her office was in the church. And I remember once, well, I was probably about 12 years old, maybe <clears throat> probably about, say maybe nine, and I went, I sneaked into the back of the church, and uh, now it's, it's, a, it's a big church, like huge, so you've got different sections, you've got the, the back, back of the church, which is like where everybody would go and have coffee and tea, there's chairs packed out there, and then you've got the front section of the church where no one's allowed to go, and then of course, because it's a Dutch Reformed church, you have like a, a holy place. Like no one's allowed to go there. It just says the, the baptismal waters and a little little bowl. Like ooh. And then you have stairs up to the podium where only the duomini, which is like a priest, can go up to. And he wears a cloak. He has to have a cloak on when he goes there. And I remember finding my way into this building and I took the mic and I started preaching. And of course that, that created chaos because the preacher, uh, the, the actual duomini heard it and my mom heard it and my mom got into trouble. Everybody was freaking out because I was in the sanctuary, you know. And I think that's kind of maybe where it all started, you know. I, I had this passion to share. Um, and so my journey didn't quite begin there, but I was forced to church every single Sunday. My parents would drop me off. And they would go to church. They would go home and I had to go to church. And they would do the same, but I was the youngest. So my, my sister is five years older than me. And then my brother was uh, seven years older than me. And I've got an older sister, which is like a half-sister. So it's my, my, my father's child. I don't even know how much older she is than what I am. But it's many years, probably 10 or 15 years older than what I am. 
and I only met her much later in my life. But eventually, I was always kind of God. I remember I had a prayer that I would pray, and maybe still remember this prayer, but I can't quite translate it. But what I would say every night, I would not go to sleep unless I said this prayer. And it was, uh, thank you to my mother, my father, my brother, my sister. Thank you for my life. Thank you for everything you do for me. And then I would go through a little spiel, something in that line. I'd say, amen. I, would, I was too afraid because I was kind of taught that you have to love God. You know? But I mean, my life didn't reflect that. I was just a little kid. But um, I, would, I would do that every night. Unless I pass out drunk, I would pray that prayer. Right? And then if I didn't pray that prayer and I woke up the next morning, I would probably have prayed it. That's just how bad it was. It was very religious. Um, but I was always, I felt that I've always had an extreme wisdom when it came to the things of Yahweh. I remember having an argument with, with one of our uh, duomenes, which is a, a priest. Uh, it's not a priest, but maybe more closer to a reverend. I remember he was saying that if a baby dies, it goes to hell. Because we are born with sin. And I, I didn't know the scripture or the Bibles, but I know that that was a bunch of poop. Right? I even, in front of everybody there, um, I said, that's, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. We weren't born with sin, we are born into sin. And a baby that dies returns back to God. And I'm having this massive uh, you know, argument with this guy, and eventually everyone's telling me to be quiet. And I was like, well, I know I'm not wrong. But anyway, I, I gave it up. Eventually, I started dating one of these reverend's daughters. <laughs> and of course that was his worst nightmare because I was a rebel <laughs> and, and he hated me I wouldn't say he hated me I mean uh, because when I, when, I, when I wasn't dating his daughter anymore he kind of liked me and I understand why <laughs> but, but I started dating this girl and she's never kissed or never hugged and never, never held another boy's hand you know I was like the first of everything and I was this this rebel, this fighter, this pervert, sleeping around, doing all kinds of stupid things. And I was still in school. And I just kind of broke up with, with my girlfriend that was in the accident with me. So we were in this massive accident. And I uh, started dating this girl. But, but let me just step back a little bit. Um, in the accident, I was, I was supposed to kind of be dead, I guess. Because everyone in that car, my brother died. The other driver died. Uh, my girlfriend was sitting in the back seat. She got hit, a very bad head injury. She got her thigh broken. She was in intensive care for three months. Wow. You know, I was in hospital for four days. I had my throat slipped from year to year. I missed my arteries with like a millimeter on each, si each side. I don't know what a millimeter is. It's like, yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what in inches that would be. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, I was supposed to, I, mean, I remember lying in hospital and the, the doctor and the nurse was talking over me and the doctor said to the nurse, can you just cover the body please? I was like, hey, excuse me, here I am. Right. <laughs> but when I was in the car accident, I remember the lady was asking me for my ID number, which would be my, like my social security number, and she was asking me for my, for my mother's number or the number that she can call. And uh, I was in and out of consciousness, and while I was in, when I was in uh, subconscious, when I was unconscious, I would experience this dark death, blood smell, uh, dark place, and uh, only later I realized that if I died, that's where I would have gone to. Wow. It, it, it was hell. And I was experiencing a, very, experiencing a very small portion of it because of the blood that was coming out of my, um, out of my neck. But eventually I was in the hospital and uh, one of the priests came and prayed for me. And I didn't really, I can't remember the prayer, but just the fact that he came to pray for me changed something in my heart. So that was exactly a year later I actually gave my life to Jesus. The accident happened in, 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 in April, I think it was April 26, or so maybe in that facility I gave my life to Jesus a year later on the 1st of April, 1995. Um, which was pretty interesting because uh, about a week before I gave my life to Jesus, my girlfriend, which I was madly in love at this point, asked me this question. She was a spiritual, born-again Christian. She loved Jesus. And she asked me this question. She says, who's number one in your life? Now, I mean, for a, a player, there's only one answer, right? <laughs> you, baby. And she was like depressed, unhappy, and uh, the face dropped. I was like, that cannot be the wrong answer. Right. It cannot be the wrong answer. It's like, hello. She's like, you know that Jesus is supposed to be number one in your life. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh, shut up. <laughs> you know, I'm actually, okay, fine. Let's just leave it there. Um, it was probably about six months later. She asked me to come with her to a camp. I said, I'll meet you there. So I drove my own car. I got there with some of my friends. And we were just, you know, I was always a rebel. You know, I was a fighter. 
I was always against every grain you could possibly have. And I remember in my school, I would always, I uh, hated speaking like this. I would never do it. I can't do it. As a matter of fact, I would think of something really bad to say, something really bad that I would do just to get chased out of the class, you know, to go to the head office, head, headmaster's office because I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. But um, I found myself at this meeting where there was probably about 500 young people and they were all worshipping God. Now, whether they were truly worshipping God or not, that's what I saw. I saw all these crazy people jumping up and down, clapping hands. And I thought to myself, wow, that looks incredible. It's like I had that instant connection with Yahweh that night. And I, I, I heard this voice. Now, it wasn't a loud voice, but it was a voice inside of me asking me the exact same question again. Who's number one in your life? And in my heart, I made a decision and I said, Lord, it's not you, but I want it to be you. Because I've always had him in my heart, but I've never committed to him. And that night, I think I committed to him. It was the 1st of April, 1995. The very next day, I shared the testimony with, with my wife, uh, with my wife, <laughs> with uh, my girlfriend at that stage. She was very excited. That was the 2nd of April. And that night, I shared my testimony. And so for me to speak in front of 500 people was like nerve-wracking. And I was the biggest, meanest guy there, and I started crying. <laughs> Like, okay, this is not right. <laughs> and if I, was, if, I was, if I had the knowledge I had 10 years ago, I would have bound Satan, you know? <laughs> Crying in front of all these people? No, that was crazy. But anyway, I did that, and it, it, it you know, just changed so many people's lives. It just touched so many people. And I got extremely on fire, almost crazy on fire. I went back were that weekend, and we started a, a salad at, at, at uh, my girlfriend's house. And there was instantly like 12, 13 people, my friends, they started giving the last Jesus. Before I know it, almost every one of my friends gave the last Jesus. And I just had an extreme passion. All of a sudden, uh, I could speak English. I was very Afrikaans. I was raised in an Afrikaans house. I could speak English because my dad was pretty good with English. My mom, was her, her work was kind of bilingual, so she had to be able to speak English. She did some studies, uh, social studies in English. So she was pretty much bilingual. And so I could speak English, but not fluently. I would, uh, I would speak English very deliciously. You, know, you can know, you can hear the accent that I was Afrikaans. But all of a sudden, as I started moving closer to God, I could pray like you've never heard before. You know, it was like weird for me because I could pray. I, I had words that just pop up and I had these revelations and these insights. And I was just drawn so much closer to Yahweh when I prayed. And I would pray in the group. Now I can talk in front of people. You know, it was crazy. But when I closed my eyes, I can talk in front of people. I remember the group grew very quickly. We did all kinds of crazy things. And there's one night we were busy praying in the room. There were probably about 12 of us. And we all held the hands. And uh, while we were busy praying, my, this one friend of mine, he let go and he jumps up and he says, I can't stand it anymore. Every time I close my eyes, something looks back at me. So me and two of my other friends would be like, okay, this is a demon. This is a demon. We have to cast this demon out. So we went on this journey, uh, not knowing in, in any way, fashion, or form how to cast out demons. Mm. It was very funny. <clears throat> so my, the other two friends, they have done it before, apparently. Or well, they've heard of how to do it, or they went through some course on how to do it. <coughs> so the four of us go to the rugby field, same one where I saw Jesus. <coughs> and um, we're sitting around the circle, we're holding hands, and he's sitting in the middle. But before we do that, um, I, was rem I was reminded that earlier that day, the Lord gave me a scripture which says, I give you the keys. <coughs> I give you the keys of, uh, I don't know, uh, authority or something in that line. It was giving me the keys and I was the key. That's what I got out of this whole scripture that I read. And by the way, I struggled with reading. I was like the worst reader on the planet. <coughs> <coughs> And I remember saying, okay, I know exactly what to do. So I grabbed him on his forehead and I started casting out this demon. I bind you and I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. And, I, and nothing happened. And I'm like, okay, 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 fine. That didn't work, so let's, let's do it the way you want to do it. So we sit around the circle and he's sitting in the middle. And my friend starts looking him in the eye and he starts doing it. All of a sudden, this guy starts manifesting. But like crazy. I mean, his eyes go green. Like he had green eyes, but he's, he's the white around his eye goes like a neon green, like the tears coming out of his face lights up. And he starts speaking in this weird voice. And we don't know what it is, because now we say, okay, well, we have to find out what's his name. And I remember um, a friend of mine used to 
they used to play a glassy glassy I don't know what you like, call it what do you call it Ouija board. Ouija board so in Africa in Africans they call it a glass glass you take a glass same as a Ouija board but you take a glass and you put that on and then the demons would start moving this glass and they were playing with this and this guy came into the room while they were doing it and made a joke he took the glass and made as if he drank what was in there <laughs> And one of the guys that was sitting around the circle was in that room and remembered what that demon's name was that was in the glass at the time that he came in. <laughs> so he's sitting there now. He's sitting around the circle and the one guy that knows the name says, Bachness. That was the demon's name. So he's looking at me and when he said Bachness, this, this guy's head goes like this. But like, freaky. Now we're like, so we start trying to cast out this demon. I take it, we were sitting there for four hours, wow. trying to cast out these demons, talking, uh, screaming, shouting, doing whatever we can. Nothing happens. Eventually, um, we say we, we speak to him because he speaks back to us in these weird ways, you know. And it was just freaky. And I know the guy that was sitting there is one of my best friends, and that's not quite. He wouldn't act like that. So it was like a real encounter. Eventually, he says to us. Um, and we asked him who else is in there and he said he said his own name and uh, another name which was his second name so I don't want to call his name out but he, he had two names like I am Gustav Lunardus he had two names and the, the, the demon spoke of uh, Bachness and these two names not realizing that they were also demons that was in him so he eventually jumps up into the air and falls down onto the floor and he's passed out Eventually he comes back up and he tells us the whole experience and we believe that the demon is out. So he gives his life to Jesus, we pray together and uh, everything works out pretty good but he starts backsliding and of course these demons and according to the word comes back sevenfold. You know, and um, that's my first real experience because the very next year I go to Bible school. <laughs> and in Bible school, whew, this is a step into Toronto blessing. You guys okay? Is this all right? Oh yeah. Stepping, I step into the Toronto blessing. It just started. That this the church I go to is called Hatfield Christian Church, and I do Year of Your Life, which is like the first year of theology. I've made up my life, my, my mind. My parents will pay for everything. I want to become a pastor. That's all I knew. You become a pastor. If you want to be a minister, you become a pastor. I think it's the same. Yeah, in America. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the only thing there is. You want to be in ministry, you have to be a pastor. Yeah. And you can do whatever you want to do from there, but you have to be a pastor. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go study. I, I was looking at all different places, and this what used to be a Baptist church. So when I, in my search, I found this theology, this uh, um, study course that was from this Baptist church. But when I got there, it was called Hatfield Christian Church, which is no longer a Baptist church, but a full Pentecostal church. And the study, the, 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 the course was called Global University, ICI. And it was uh, internationally recognized, which is pretty good. I enjoyed it thoroughly. My first year was you go through the first three weeks, you're not allowed to go anywhere. Or the th first three months, you're not allowed to go anywhere. They disciple you. They train you. You sit for hours and hours every day and they teach you. And you live in this house with all these men of God, these kids, same age as you, um, that's doing the same course. And it was incredible. My, my passion for Yahweh just grew and grew and grew. Um, you weren't allowed to go home for the first three months. Afterwards, every time I go home, I backslide. <laughs> I was very talented. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> very, very talented. As a matter of fact, I backslid so many times, small little backslides, or backslides, and it was not that small. You know, when, a, when you're a baby Christian, um, fornication is not that big. <laughs> you know, I mean, smoking some marijuana, using some drugs, that's, it's not that big. You know, you were just unsaved the other day. So it's, I mean, I remember sharing my testimony with a girl right after I got born again. She stopped me halfway and she said, wow, but you can swear. I'm like, yeah, well, I didn't invent some of these words the world's using. <laughs> but I remember coming back every time and then I would share my, my testimony of how I failed with somebody. And they'll rebuke me. You know, how can you say you love Jesus and you keep falling back, sleeping around? You, you're away for just two weeks and you come back, you look like you're demon possessed, you know? Um, but I basically, eventually I broke my rededicator and I could no longer give my life to Jesus. That, that thing was broken. There was nothing left of it. But uh, I, I things slowly started changing. My passion was extreme for him. 
You know, I was uh, extremely accurate with the gifts of prophecy, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Um, the counseling structure that, that they taught us was incredible, and working, working with the gifts was just absolutely amazing. I remember going to, church, going to schools, because they would start asking me to come to um, different schools, because I was a cell leader, or assistant cell leader, um, during the week uh, as one of the, um, you know, the, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, year of your life, leaders or kids mm -hmm. um, and so I would I would go minister to all these kids in the south and eventually they would ask me to come to their schools over a time period and I would pass over the kids preach a message you know and it was really powerful I remember going to a um, a group of, of, of kids it was probably about 150 maybe 200 people and I shared my testimony and I did an altar call and every single person in that room ran forward to give their lives to Jesus it was like wow yeah. well, the, most, the most incredible thing and I then praying over them and prophesying over them it was it just was the beginning of something that I absolutely love doing um, in this time I remember going to my school and I said to my principal which he was like all freaked out but he was like not really with it. I said to him, I want to come and share my testimony with the school. And he said, well, okay, let's give it one year. And he wrote it in his diary, a year from the day that I was there. And he put it in his diary. If you, could, if you come back on this date and you're still on fire for, the, for Jesus, then you can share your testimony with the school. I'll give you 20 minutes. And of course, I came back a year later and I got to share my testimony with my school. I was, a, I was a rebel in my school. I don't want to talk too much detail about it, but... People came to me when they wanted to fight, to ask me if it's okay if I beat that guy up just for in case I know him. <laughs> that was like the, the, the dawn in my school. I was also a, a year older than everybody because I failed my grade 7. I also failed grade 9. No, no, no grade, it's, it's not, not grade 7, it was, uh, it was grades, grade 9 and grade 11. Mm. But grade 11, they didn't want to fail me because they, they came to me and the headmaster said, listen, we put you through because we really just want you out of school. <laughs> the teachers, as he said this, he said to me, the teachers are afraid of you. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's my plan, bro. That's exactly what I do. My thing with the teachers was I had to make them cry. It was, and I did. I did a pretty good job. But anyway, so I, I, was, in, I was getting this opportunity to go speak to my school and so I shared my testimony, you know, remind you, I, I was Afrikaans, and I failed English miserably, um, but you have to pass it, so I, the teacher helped me through, because she kind of saw something in me that I didn't see, or no one else saw. But uh, when I shared my testimony, everything was English, everything switched from Afrikaans to English, so I'm speaking at the rate that I teach to you guys, so it's 145,000 miles an hour, I'm speaking to five, about 650 kids, um, for 20 minutes in English, the language that I don't know, fluently, and when I say, who wants to give their lives to Jesus, it was like one accord, the entire school raised their hands. That was incredible. I mean, I was blown away. Yeah. I could feel the anointing and the power of Yahweh on and over me. And uh, immediately I went to the principal afterwards and asked him if I could come back during the week. So we brought some pamphlets and we did some things. And that was, that was just the beginning for me. And I started going to schools. I started working with other, other ministries. Um, eventually I felt that I needed to go to Rama Bible School. I went to Rama Bible School and they were very powerful. It was an incredible church. It still is an incredible church. And I, I was in this Bible school. So it's a little bit different in theology. You know, theology, uh, my, my teacher would say something like this, Gustav, um, don't write what I teach you, write what's in the book, because it'll be that different. <laughs> you know, the Bible, was, the book would say one thing, and the teacher would have taught us something else, because he didn't want to teach what's in the, word, in the, in the book, because he, didn't, he said, well, you can read the book yourself, but I don't want to teach you what's in the book, because it's not a truth. It's some kind of a theory that you don't want to base your, your theology on. And so Bible school was different. It was someone else's interpretation of the truth, which was really nice for me. I enjoyed it. It was easier. Uh, there was no exam, exams that you have to pass, otherwise you fail. It was just easy. It was good. Um, but I remember I got really irritated with the people, like really, really irritated. I would come back from a weekend. And I would speak to one specific guy that was like my friend. And I would say, so how was your weekend? And he would say, oh, brother. Jesus used me mightily. And I would be like, well, I didn't really ask you that. I just wanted to know how was your weekend. You know, just give me an all answer. Don't have to, ooh, 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 you know, I felt that religion and it became to really grieve me. Um, now, I'm not blaming anybody. It was my own hate for religion that really just shook me backwards. Eventually, I found myself, uh, how can I say, 
backslidden. I met a girl, a girl. I always meet girls with too many, too many girls in my life. <laughs> but I, I met, I met a woman, and we started dating. And slowly but surely, I stopped going to Bible school. I started working at the gym, and we started sleeping together. And the the more we spent time together, the further I stepped away from God. Eventually, uh, we would go to nightclubs. I mean, I, when I, night, nightclubs was one of my escapes. I always went to nightclubs. I was like a nightclub freak. I was bouncers in, in nightclubs from a very young age. I was always a big guy. But uh, we started dating and we started uh, just doing all kinds of things together. We didn't do any drugs together, but I used to go out do, do, you know, do drugs with my friends. Um, eventually, I met Claire, which is now my wife. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, she was a uh, druggie. She was very talented. <laughs> she overdosed on uh, 16 gra 12 grams of cocaine when she was 16 years old. She moved out of her house when she was 13. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like Jesus, this is my wife. Yeah. You know? She was uh, into all kinds of witchcraft and uh, she was just over the top. I mean, they used to go out um, on drugs with friends to beat people up that owes money to the drug cartel that they get a portion of to buy drugs with. Wow. This is my tiny little wife right. <laughs> that was a vicious little girl. And I remember that because sometimes when we were fighting, I could see that viciousness coming out of her. I'm like, ah, okay, <laughs> I mean, not mess with that. <laughs> but slowly but surely, you know, we didn't want to mess with each other because she was dating someone, I was dating someone, but I was a assistant manager of the gym that she was working at. Um, so we were just friends. But I remember when, when I saw her the first time, I was doing a spinning course. <laughs> so I was, wear, I was wearing uh, hot pants, help me Jesus. <laughs> I was very young, I don't know why I would do that, but I just finished the bodybuilding competition, so I was like lean, lean, lean. I had this hot pants on with this tight little shirt, which I would never wear now, even if someone had to literally pay me to wear it. So I was w walking around the gym with this thing because I was doing a spinning course, and she was, uh, her and her friends were Googling over me. Thank you. I know, right? <laughs> but, but I was Googling over her too, you know, and it was lust at first sight. Mm -hmm. But we never did anything, we never, we just kind of eyed each other out for about a year. And then she came, uh, well actually when I met her about six, six weeks later she came to my club where I was working and she was one of the sales consultants and we became really good friends. And then uh, she went back and so I, haven't, I didn't see her for about a year. And then one day she pops into the gym where I was working and I'm backslidden, I'm not a Christian anymore. I, uh, doing all kinds of stupid things in the clubs. And mostly when I say stupid things, I wasn't so much using drugs yet. Uh, I was just drinking, I was smoking, um, and I was sleeping around. That was my, my main thing, was sleeping around. Lots of, I don't want to go into detail, it's really not necessary, but that was my thing. Woman was my issue. Um, eventually when I met her, we started dating and immediately moved in. And uh, she smoked marijuana, lots of marijuana. I didn't know that. Uh, about six months into our relationship, I still didn't know that she smokes marijuana. Because I would go to bed, and then she would go sit outside and smoke marijuana. So eventually, I started smoking with her. And I remember after that, we were in the, in the, in the rave scene, and we went, I was introduced to uh, ecstasy. I was introduced to uh, um, acid. I uh, started using it only on weekends, then it went uh, Wednesdays and weekends, and it was really nice to bounce, well, not bounce, but be a bouncer <laughs> on acid. I don't know if that's ever a good idea, but it was, I took a half of acid, and then I would go to work, and that's the kind of something I did for a long time. And it, it became an addiction, but I'm not, very an, I'm not really an addictive person. But in this process, I constantly wanted to get back with God. But I couldn't speak to Him, I couldn't do anything. I felt so bad, so what I would do is I would just speak in tongues. Just when there was no one around, I would just go rubbish, knowing that, that I feel the grief of not being with Him. Eventually, I would go back to church, and me and my girlfriend, Claire, now my wife, we will still sleep together, live together, but I would go to church and try and change, and then I will start a home cell, and we'll, it will flourish, and I'll preach to my friends, and before I know it, I'm back in the nightclubs back doing what I always did, using drugs, doing all kinds of stupid things. And I remember trying to go to Bible school even, you know, and that didn't work. You know, there was, all, there was no, no money in the time that I was really struggling with all of this. But eventually, I got back on fire for Yahweh after I, I was in a massive car accident, broke my leg, and I went to my pastor, one of my pastors, there's several in our church, and he says to me, well, you know, I feel in the spirit, this is what the Lord says. 
You know, that says the Lord God Almighty. That's not how he did it. He's not religious. He was just an incredible man of God. He still is. He says to me, um, this is your last chance. Next time, Satan's going to kill you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that was it for me. That was like, what? I had to change right there. And immediately there was a change in me. And I went back to Claire and I said, baby, I want to I kind of uh, wanna stop sleeping together. I want to give it a year. Um, completely set apart from you, uh, not 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 see you, but I don't want to live with you, I don't want to sleep in the same bed with you, uh, and I want us to make this a, a holy coming together, you know, because after a year we'll get married, and she didn't understand that, she was upset, but eventually uh, she got a prophecy from a friend of ours, Mark Redenkamp, and he shared with her a very powerful prophecy that changed her life. It was like she committed, recommitted herself to him fully on that night. And then everything kind of burst open for us. I was then asked by a friend of mine to join in his ministry in Cape Town. So that was kind of intense for me. But then uh, I said, yes, we'll do it. And in this process, because it wasn't just going to happen immediately. It was over about six, seven months that it needed to happen. But in this process, a friend of mine, one of my best friends, was in a car accident and he died. And in, the, in his death... We got to lead his girlfriend to Jesus, and um, I got to start working with uh, this Mark Wiedenkamp uh, man, absolutely incredible prophet, incredible man of God. I remember uh, the very first time I heard him, he would prophesy and pray in tongues at the same speed. And I thought it was the most incredible thing I've ever heard. So he would go. Okay, this is what I feel the Father saying. And he would just start rambling this out of his mouth, just prophesying to whoever is busy holding his hand. He's holding someone's hand. He's prophesying over them. Very powerful, very incredible man of God. And that was it. That was it. That's what I wanted to be like. That was my motivation. So when me and Claire came back, he, um, at a funeral of, uh, uh, um, no, no, not a funeral. It was more like a, thank God I didn't die meeting. I don't know if that, you know, thanking God that he survived the accident because there was two people in the accident. The one died and the one didn't. The one that didn't die was also a very good friend of mine and um, he was also a man of God, an incredible man of God and still is. Um, but we had a, a meeting at for him, you know, for the celebration of his life. And um, in this process, I got to go work for Mark. And uh, that was an incredible time for my, in my life, you know, just being able to sit under him a very short time because I've already decided in my heart, according to what I feel that Yahweh wanted me to do, I had to go with, uh, with Lucas Korf, which is also an incredible man of God, a very powerful prophet, very powerful uh, in the apostolic ministry, you know, he had a youth ministry, he wanted us to join in Cape Town. But I, I felt in my heart that that's what I needed to do. Mark made it very clear to me that uh, he wanted me to come with him. He was starting a ministry in Durban. But I felt in my heart that I had to go to Cape Town, which was a very tough decision for me because Mark's my year. <laughs> you know, he's always been my year. I wanted to be with him. Slowly but surely, my life was changing. And I, I, was, I was feeling the draw to Cape Town. I was already on fire. My wife was on fire. She, was, she is on fire. She's always on fire. But we got married. On the 8th of February and the 11th, we went Cape Town. That was our honeymoon. <laughs> wasn't, we never had, we've never had, a, had an actual honeymoon. But um, we immediately started full-time ministry and everything went wrong. We were promised a salary when we got there. When we got there, there was, uh, the funds were pulled back, so there was nothing. So that was the process where Yahweh started teaching us how to live by faith. And we had to do all kinds of things to get money. It was just me and Claire, so it was easy. But I would, uh, I would uh, find myself just engaging in, the ha in, in, in prayer constantly in His Word. I had a, a passion that I didn't see in anybody else. You know, I look at my friends that gave their lives to Jesus with me. They all kind of faded out, faded away, and I'm still the only one standing. You know, I remember then having to, to start the church with Him, and it was very powerful. I did the offerings, <laughs> which is really not my specialty, but that's what I, that was my job. And this, uh, obviously we did all the counseling, we did some of the counseling, we, we packed out the chairs, we cleaned the toilets, we scrubbed the floors, where it was a, a public venue. And that was our job, you know, as the assistant pastors of the church. It grew very quickly because the advertising was very powerful. They would advertise in the newspapers and put big, big billboards up all over the place. So before we know it, we had 150, 200 people at the church. That was very nice. Um, we then started the Bible school out of that. Um, where my wife was like the dean of the Bible school. Uh, we both also did the Bible school, um, which 
this is my, my third Bible school, <laughs> you know, um, did the Bible school, and while I was doing the Bible school, the senior pastor of our mother church asked me, um, or asked, if they, asked if they could ordain me as a pastor. So um, we had the massive meeting for several other men of God also getting ordained. So that was probably about 15 years ago, no, no, 14, maybe 12 years ago that I got ordained. And in the ordination, I was asked to start a church in rugby which is a little town in Cape Town, just up the road from where we were. And um, that was very tough. Uh, they, I started doing some counseling, I've not counseling, some scouting, handing out pamphlets, speaking to people, and we launched the church. The first meeting, I had four people. That was exciting. The second meeting, I had one person. And then it was because, I, no, 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 it must have been, because I said, Lord, even if there's just one person, I will still preach. And so the next Sunday, there was just one person. And my wife's like, do not say stuff like that to God, okay? <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, fine, let's not do that again. Um, but for the whole year that I was in this specific venue, there was a maximum of seven people come to church every week. It was very frustrating. It was a church, so there should be more people, you know. Um, and then one night, uh, one day, I had to preach at the, at the big church, or the, the, the mother church, and Claire was sharing her testimony and preaching at our church. But we just moved venues. And she gets there, and there's like 65 people. And she's all a little bit freaked out. She shares her testimony, comes back, and she tells me about it, and I'm like, what? How did that happen? From se seven people to 65 people in, in one week. And just changing, not even massive venue change, it's not even different places, it was just one around the corner, you know? Uh, but anyway, so it changed. And immediately from that time, the church just started growing. But then my pastor started going through a, a process in his life where his wife, he passed away of a cystic fibrosis, um, if that's the right wording. Very sad process that he went through, very, very... Uh, Challenging for him as a man of God. He believed in raising the dead, casting a demon. He did all these things already in his life. Uh, he couldn't get his life, his wife back to life. You know, it was a really just a tough time. Not that that it was his job to do it. You know, it was just something that didn't happen. We were all frustrated and angry and just crazy stuff. So he needed my help at the church. So the mother church asked me to shut the church down that I was at. First of all, they said, well, there's no funds coming in. There's no people in the church. They didn't know the whole story of how it just changed and how it exploded. But because of my, my submission to my leaders, I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. I, didn't, I was crying. It was a sad day. But we shut down the church. And eventually, we would go carpool people over to, to the mother church and it just faded out. Um, but my passion for Yahweh never changed. I just uh, started growing deeper and deeper and deeper into a relationship with Him. Um, and I was always against the grain. Always. Everything I preached was against the grain. Everything I prophesied was against the grain. Everything I did in the church was kind of against the grain. It was just because I'm, I'm, I was just out there in a different way, if that makes any sense. Eventually, my pastor was basically fired, but not really. He was asked to step down because they wanted someone else to come in and run the mother church. So they, they took his, his, his uh, cell phone allowance, they took his salary, they took his medical aid, everything. And he had to basically go find something else to do. And they asked me to take over the church that he planted in Cryfontaine. Uh, so me and my wife, we started uh, the church there. We did, went to the church there. We started uh, with uh, our wrestling match. <laughs> that was the ministry that I was in. We started the ministry, so we uh, basically get the massive wrestling ring out there with all the wrestlers that was part of the AWF. That was the wrestling that I did. My name was the Saint. Help me, Jesus. Um, but we would have a man in the middle. That's how we launched the church. There would be a little boy in the middle of the church, of the ring, and he would uh, just walk around with his school bag, and all of a sudden doubt would come in, and doubt would just start beating him up. <laughs> and then hate and murder and violence and drugs and, and sex and all these demonic entities would come in and beat him up until he's half dead and then he falls on his knees and he screams out God just give me faith and uh, well that's when I come running out and kick everyone's butt throw them all out of the ring and then I start preaching uh, Ephesians 4 uh, Ephesians uh, 6 12 <laughs> our wrestlers not against flesh and blood um, so then this church started, and uh, because it was an Afrikaans church, and I could only do this in English, from 80, 85 people, within six months, it went down to more than, less than half of that. And so, kind of built a, a core, and I was getting frustrated. I thought, oh my God, I was not called to be a pastor. You know, I hated the issues of the people. You know, it was just like, what? Really? Seriously? <laughs> it was just too much for me. You know, I, I remember ordaining... 
according to the desire that I felt in my heart for this specific couple, they wanted to lead the youth. So I ordained them in front of the whole congregation to be youth leaders. They were excited. They were doing it. Yes, that's what they want. And it was a great moment. The very next week, they come to me and say, Oh, God told us that this is it. We're leaving the church. I'm like, uh, uh, uh. That happened several times. God always tells people to leave the church. So it was just very frustrating. It was, oh, it was dragging me. It felt like a burden. Everything was a burden. There was no money. There was no nothing. You know, the Lord made it again. Gave me a choice. He said, keep on doing personal training or go full-time in the ministry. I want to teach you things. I want to train and equip you. So I left the personal training, and there was no salary. There was no money for the church. There was nothing. It was just a big, fat help me Jesus, you know, um, but he, you know, we lived, we came through it, we had two kids at that stage already, but I remember going into a, um, a, a what do you call it, a, um, let me just try and remember what, it, what you would call it, you don't have a shopping mall, going into a shopping mall, and this guy, I was in the one store, and my wife was sitting at the coffee shop, waiting for me to finish, and this guy comes walking up to her with a note, and he gives it to her. It's a prophecy. She reads it. She bursts into tears. Now, if you know my wife, crying is not her specialty. She's like an emotional rock. Mm -hmm. uh, she does not cry. She does not get sad. She doesn't want kisses and hugs. She's like a gangster. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So she's crying. And I'm thinking, okay, this is definitely a man of God. You know? and it has to be. This must be God speaking directly to my wife. Because she's crying. I was like, what? How do you even do that? So we started talking with this guy. I... Uh, get really connected to him, and he's, he becomes my spiritual father, Ashley McLuhan, Israel McLuhan. Um, we connect up, and he basically comes to my church to minister, and he creates havoc. <laughs> basically, tell them this is not a pastor; he can no longer pastor this church. And I'm sitting there, uh, what? <laughs> he can no longer pastor this church. He is not called to be a pastor. He's called to be an apostolic, a father. He cannot manage or govern the church the way he has at the moment. Everything has to change, and so. Massive, massive shift happens. Everything changes. My, my engagement with Yahweh changes. I shift to a deeper place with Him. Um, and I get all freaked out. Within, within six months, the church uh, breaks down into half of what there was already. So from, from, from 30 to 15, which is really depressing. If you're a pastor and you come out of a mega church, that's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> really, really depressing. But anyway, he starts uh, opening doors for me in America. Um, tons of money just starts coming in all of a sudden for me to go to America, but no one knew that I was going to America. He says to me, well, I've gotten you some arrangements, some speeding arrangements, speaking arrangements, you have to go to America. I'm thinking to myself, well, that's easy to say, and I don't have any salary, there's no money coming in, what are you talking about? The very next morning, someone paid 45,000 rand my account, which is about three and a half thousand dollars, which is more than enough for me to pay for a ticket and come to America. It was the Baton Rouge for the very first time. Well, I started teaching my own message, which I really enjoyed, a very powerful message. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, what, was it? what was it? I haven't preached it in such a long time. The attitude of a warrior. <coughs> no one's ever heard anything like it. It was like the most incredible thing. Everybody comes forward. I prophesy over them. America really embraced me and enjoyed it, you know. I would go back and I would get a sum of money in again, and the Lord would tell me to come back in. Opened up some other states. Did that four or five times. Then I received the prophecy from, from, from my dad, my spiritual father, but from Yahweh saying that we have to come to America, this will be our base. Now that's a, a lot of frustration that goes in, but in this time of receiving the prophecy, when he gave me this word, I could feel the elevation to the next level. The very next week, um, someone started sending me emails from um, a company of Burning Hearts. And that's where everything kind of started. I remember lying in my bed in America, listening to Ian Clayton talk about the, the courts of heaven. And all I could think of is, I bind you, Satan. I bind you, Satan. This is not of God. This is demonic. But that's where the journey really started. And I couldn't understand anything he said. I couldn't perceive anything he said. And that puzzled me. Because I, in the spirit realm, in the spiritual things, I could I have great understanding. In my, if I look at my Bible schools, I always ace almost everything. You know, I hardly ever failed any subjects. And failing a subject means less than 70%. You know, everything, everything under 7% is a fail, so I always passed all my subjects. The ones I did fail was things like um, Hebrew and Greek, but I just struggled with them. I couldn't read the words, you know. I was like, what? Um, but I rewrote them and I passed them all. But I remember 
not being able to understand what he was saying freaking me out. So I just I started going deeper and deeper into what he was saying. And I shut down what he was teaching and I started going into the spirit. Eventually I heard a message where he was preaching on dividing soul and spirit. And that's where this journey of where I am right now really started. Getting into having divide my soul and spirit. That was all I focused on. I mean, I preached that message in my church probably a hundred times, just to the small group of people that was in our, in our Bible school and in the meeting that I had at my house on a Sunday. And I would preach this message in different ways, but not for them, for me to understand, you know. And I would go into the Spirit, and I, would, I, I got it very clearly, very quickly I got it. Because I remember sitting in a soaking meeting, because we had morning services and then an evening service. The evening service was just free for all, you know. The Holy Spirit just leads and let us just worship for 45 minutes and just go into whatever is out there for us to go into. I wouldn't prepare a message. I would just be led by the Spirit. And I remember going into the Spirit realm where I would find myself in America. My father was staying in uh, Orlando, Florida in a house on a golf estate. Beautiful house, big house. And I remember, I remember going into the Spirit realm, but I was walking to and fro. That's all I knew. So I went to his house, knocked on the door because I wanted, I said to the Father, I want to, I want to go to my father's house. I got there, I knocked on the door, there was no one there. I walked to the back, went in through the window to see what, you know, see if I can see anything. There was, there was no one in the house, went into the garage, see if there was cars, there was no cars. The same, same day I texted my, my, my dad on Facebook, I said, where, where are you guys? You know, are you, are you not at home? He's like, no, we went out for the weekend. And that was my first journey in the spirit. You know, it was weird. It was, uh, wow. And so what would have happened if he was there? Would I have been able to communicate with him as a spirit being? Or would it, what would, how? I, I didn't understand that. So I just started doing this constantly with everything. Now, you couldn't, I couldn't speak about this to anybody because the church still thinks that's demonic. Um, I would engage with all Ian's teachings, as many as I could find. And I would wake up in the morning at 5 o'clock and I would just sit on my couch and I would sit there until 9 o'clock, that's 4 hours, 5 hours, just drink a cup of coffee, close my eyes, and I would just go into the Spirit and experience all kinds of crazy, crazy things. And the revelation just started coming, I just started downloading, I could feel the change in my DNA, I could feel the change in my body, I could feel how things were just aligning up and falling into place. Um, then where I am right now, when I started coming to America, I had one message. <laughs> and the one message was dividing soul and spirit, that's all I had, I had nothing else. But immediately, I could feel how the Lord, every time I go in, there was a download. Every time I go in, every time I go into the kingdom of heaven, there was a download. When I shut my eyes, and I take the train of thought, and I started going into worship, adoration, just pressing into Yahweh, immediately, I would begin to see, I would begin to understand, I would begin to perceive and receive. When I started walking with the seven spirits, the whole explosion took place. Because I remember lying on the floor soaking, and the Father showed me my scroll. And it, uh, I was through a process that I've experienced it, but this specific encounter where, where my scroll was opened up and this massive spirit being popped out, it was myself, and it was, I was on fire, a son of fire standing there. It was like a blue orange flame burning on the outside with a deep, different color of fire burning on the inside. Uh, I looked at myself and thinking, wow, you're kind of nice, you know, and, wow, <laughs> huge, you know, and, and I was saying in this one position and my spirit man would just, it would, would like start vibrating and it would multiply into a city. It would do the same thing several times. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of me just multiplied into all these different cities into each and every state in the entire America, you know, which freaked me out. I, I just, that's just what I saw. And when I came back out of it, I thought to myself, I don't know what that could possibly mean. You know, I mean, what is that? You know, wow, that was incredible. But I don't have any meetings. I have, I had several meetings planned, but not a spirit school, you know, and within a week after that, the first spirit school started. I was invited to a church, ministered a message, the pastor asked me if I want to come back the next week, the next week, the next week, the next week. It's been five years. <laughs> and from there, the blueprint opened up. And of course, we are at there's all these different schools, all the different places. And been just going deeper and deeper into the kingdom of heaven, just getting more and more revelation on what the Father is establishing. But, but, but the mo main thing was understanding what my earthly function is and what my, my, spirit, my, my spiritual function is. So the, the function of my scroll on, in the kingdom of earth and my scroll in the kingdom of heaven. How to differentiate between those two and how those two needs to be basically run right next to each other. What I do with the schools, with my students, teaching them, being taught at the same time because most of what I say is given to me while I'm saying it. 
but it's an infused knowledge that I know my spirit carry, or I carry as a spirit being, but my soul, the one that really relates to the message, doesn't have the understanding of it as before it comes out. And I have notes, and I would get notes anywhere just because I don't really need the notes. I just, because I always, I have a problem with speaking in front of people. It's just not something that's ever going to go away, but it's become much easier. I just want something in front of me that if I struggle, I can just go to my notes. Mm -hmm. But 99% of the time, it's just, it comes out of my mouth as my spirit downloads into my, into my soul. Um, and, and of course, then understanding the courts of heaven, understanding my function in the kingdom of heaven, as the Father Billy training, teaching me as I'm walking with the seven spirits, going from there into creation as a son of Yahweh, aligning creation, aligning things into place here for the different states that the Father has given me. And just beginning, and this is where I am right now, beginning to understand who I am, not just in the earth, but also in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, how the Father is training. Now, I'm still a baby, and I say this all the time, but growing and changing and shifting is phenomenal. You know? And it's one thing that I, I wanted in my heart, but I didn't really care for too much. <coughs> I'm going to close with this. <coughs> Over the last five years, every time I, the first time I met Ian, now I see him as, as my main mentor, not my spiritual father, just a mentor, someone that I really love and honor, respect, look up to, um, think that he's absolutely... Uh, phenomenal in what he does. First time I met him, I wrote him an email, not knowing that he would get it in any way, fashion or form, just a basic email on his website. I went into the, the conference in Mobile. Now, I know the pastor there because he's my spiritual father's spiritual brother. They have the same spiritual father. So I've always I've met him about eight years before I met Ian. Um, so there was a connection in some way, fashion or form. But Ian, I said to him, I'm a big African guy, but I'm not black. <laughs> I'm a white African. Um, so as I, as I come in from the back towards the front, he looks at me and he says, come. Because I ask him if I can have 10 minutes of his time. And it was really just to give him a hug, to tell him how incredible he is and how much I love his ministry, and to thank him for everything that he's done for me. Then I, I didn't see him in a year because I went back to the same conference the next year. Or there was a, there was a, a, a meeting in, in Baton Rouge. So I went there and uh, we spoke a little bit, but he didn't recognize me. Then in Mobile, I spoke to him again, and he says, oh, yeah, yeah, you, you're the guy with, um, with the prison ministry. I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so this guy really doesn't know who I am, and it's, you know, I'm 300 pounds right. of muscle. <laughs> I'm not somebody you forget that easily, <laughs> but he meets thousands of people, so I was okay, you know, fine, whatever. Um, in my heart, it was, it was a little bit sore, you know, because I really wanted a recognition from him for what I'm doing. You know, this is something I do every single week, almost every single day of the week, and I do it because I want people to understand and have revelation of what's already out there and what's being taught, but in smaller portions. Mm -hmm. Because I remember how I struggled with the first message I heard. It was like, what? But if I take this and I cut it up into smaller portions, and feed it to somebody in a different way than when it came towards me, they will understand it easier and quicker. And so over the last five years, every time I go there, he thinks I'm someone else. <laughs> and I was like, okay, wait, this, is, this can't be that difficult, you know. <laughs> Gustav. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it was this incredible. This time, he immediately recognized me because something's changed in my spirit. You know, he looked, he introduced me to his wife, and he said, this is the guy I was telling you about that does everything the same as what we do it. Um, he's taken my, my, uh, my uh, teachings and break it up into smaller portions to feed the body of Christ with. And uh, I was like, whoa, <laughs> wait, are you talking about me? Or are you now thinking I'm someone else again? You know? And then uh, every time he um, saw me, he called me forward and introduced me to somebody that uh, he would say the same thing to. He introduced me to Lindy, which is uh, Lindy Masters. And I was like... What is happening? Yeah, it was incredible. For me, that was the elevation that I guess I needed to go to the next level where the Father wanted me to be. To establish not just what I've done over the last five years, but to feel in my heart that this is something that I'm doing that is really changing lives. Mm -hmm. you know, so the journey I've been on has been pretty interesting, pretty freaky. Of course, in this time, my mother and my father has died. Um, a lot of my friends died on my, my wedding, my best, my best man died, and then my other best man that was supposed to come, he had to pick his wife up, his mom up from the airport, so couldn't come to my wedding. I was like, seriously dude, you know, you can bring your mother as well, <laughs> and find an a, um, emergency best man. <laughs> but, um, you know, 
we had our kids. We have an incredible life in America. The Lord's blessed us. He's uh, shown us favor everywhere we go. Um, my journey with Him is absolutely incredible. And I, I want to encourage you guys to never give up. Although you don't understand or perceive things, just keep doing it the way you have it in your heart. You know, keep doing it according to what you feel in your heart to do it. Uh, whether you're feeling something, whether you're not feeling it, it's there, you're experiencing it. Um, I've had many of my sons and daughters over the years, I can feel how they pull back because they feel they don't understand. They, they've exp experienced things, they expected things, and it didn't happen the way they wanted it to happen, the way they believed it would happen, and then they would start falling back. In my life, I have, I have never had an expectation um, to experience anything beyond what I could imagine in the natural. I don't know if that makes any sense. For example, I would not trust God right now for a house because I've never trusted Him for $250,000. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. I've trusted Him for cars and it's come through. Cars, $4,000 car, $2,500 car, that's, that's where I'm at. $50,000 car, $100,000 car, I'm not there yet. You know, uh, uh, rent that, that we're paying right now every month, yes. But a, a house of $250,000, I'm not there yet. You know, am I ready for a house of $100,000? I don't know if I can trust him. He can meet me only where I'm at. You know, so in the spirit, it's the same thing. I want to be where Ian is. I want to be where all those guys are that are doing all these incredible things. I want to levitate and I want to walk through walls and I want to appear and, and get caught on fire. And I want to see all these phenomenal things that I've seen in the spirit in the future room. But I can only go where I'm at. And I'm never, I've never pushed myself out of bounds. I know that sounds, well, maybe you should. No, no. You want to stay in, in, in the bound that you're in. Because if I'm expecting to do that, and I'm not really there because I just see everyone else doing it, so I want to be there, I can't go there lest I finish where I'm at. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason why you go to grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4, grade 5, grade 6, grade 7. If you're really, really good and really educated, you might skip one or two grades. But you want to go through the process because each one of those grades is teaching you something. Right. So that by the time you get to where you want to be, you have the framework for what's being put on you. Yes. And that's what the Father's doing with the Ecclesia right now. He's putting a framework on us to begin to walk in the things that He's called us to and wanted to establish in us. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's stand up. I don't know if that was... Uh, that's interesting. I've never done that before. So. That was amazing. <laughs> well, Father... We just want to, want to thank you and praise you and, and glorify and magnify your incredible, beautiful, phenomenal, majestic name, Lord. I pray tonight that you would just have speak, spoken into the lives of those that's on this journey, Father, that it doesn't just happen immediately, that it's a process of learning. It. It's a lot of fighting, a lot of warfare, a lot of pushing in. There's a lot of giving up and then going back. A lot of, oh, I didn't work, I don't trust this, this is not going to work, I don't believe in this stuff. Um, eventually, uh, I remember being at a place in my life where I just wanted to give up on you. I didn't want anything to do with you. I was actually against you. <laughs> but my heart was always turned towards you. And that's what brought me to where I am today, Father. It's my heart that is faced towards you. And I know that so many of us go through a lot of struggles, a lot of irritations and frustrations, especially when it comes to our faith. We pray for the sick and they die. We pray for finances and we go bankrupt. Uh, we pray for people to see and they, they just, nothing changes. It's just a lack of understanding regarding our faith and what we feel in our heart should happen and then it doesn't happen, the letdown. But Father, let's get to the place in our walk where we never give up no matter what happens. I remember Todd Bentley saying something in one of his teachings. He prayed for more than a thousand people before he saw his first miracle. I remember praying for a lady once and while I was in prayer, I went, uh, the, the machine went, I almost had a heart attack and didn't ever want to pray for anybody again. But I had to go back on and I had to start over again. And it's the same with the Spirit. You might not get into the Spirit right now, but you keep doing it by faith. Before you know it, you're engaging with the angelic. Before you know it, you're engaging with the, 20, with, 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 with the seven spirits, with the 22, 24 elders. Before you know it, you're seeing Yahweh face to face. You're engaging with Him as your Father. He's busy pouring into you. Before you know it, you're operating out of the courts of heaven. Before you know it, you begin to grow and mature into your position. Before you know it, everything is fully fully explained and open to you and you're engaging as a son 
from out of the kingdom of heaven, from out of the full faces of Yahweh into creation, answering the call, aligning things, and bringing things back into propulsion. Father, we're excited for what you're doing. I pray that you bless your people. Keep us safe. Let us remind ourselves that we go in through righteousness, joy, peace. We go in through the way, the truth, and the life. We go in through justice, judgment, and holiness. We step into all of who you are, and we live and move and have our being in you. Father, we love you. We praise you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.